Good morning. My name is Jeffrey D. Dahl, and I want to share with you today some of the things that are on my heart. My wife, Colleen's always telling me uh, that I should share, and so I will. And, you know, a lot of times in uh, modern day churches, we don't always have a forum, a forum to share because a pastor preaches, you know, 90% of the time, and then other people or guest speakers share, and and that's okay. I mean, that's kind of the traditional format, and uh, so I'm just kind of utilizing another format, which is uh, YouTube. So I'm coming to you this morning with my cup of coffee and my Bible. And with some things on my heart. And uh, I want to talk to you today about Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. Written in 1517. Oh my. You know, most Christians today, when I say Christians, I would include Catholics or Christians. People who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Uh, people who believe that that. Jesus' blood upon the cross saved them from their sins. That's the bottom line with Christianity. And the word Christian is to be Christ-like. And so, you know, when I went to India in 1984 with my parents, I learned real quick that uh, um, 90%, or let's see, only 1%, there's a billion people in India, and only 1% of or half of one percent is Christian, and of that half of one percent, ninety percent of that is Catholic. And so, in '84, uh, my parents and I worked side by side with Jesuit priests who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, there's a term uh, a lot of Protestants. Uh, oh, I got to come back to that term Protestant in a minute, but. A lot of term, a lot of Protestants would say is they're born again Catholics, you know, which is to mean that it's enough that Jesus' blood is enough to save you. And when my dad was there in the in India in '84, one guy spoke up. We were having an afternoon meeting, and a guy spoke up and he said, uh, uh, "You know, well, you're a Protestant, you know." And my dad looked at him. With the most eloquent answer possible. It was really cool to watch. My dad was really cool under fire. Uh, and God's spirit was with him. Because there was a real gentleness in how my dad delivered the word of God. And he said, I'm not protesting anything. I'm not here to protest anything. I'm not a, pro you know, that's where the word Protestant comes from, is protester. And so my dad took him through the Lord's Prayer and preached the whole sermon on the Lord's Prayer, which no Catholic would refute the Lord's Prayer. That's, you know, that's sacred scripture. And it was awesome, you know, because my dad wasn't there to like stir up controversy amongst the Catholic Church. And I certainly am not either. Uh, but I want to address what Martin Luther, who was a priest of priests, you have to understand, he wasn't just some you know, priest, he was a top-notch priest. If they fasted, he would fast longer. He was kind of like the Iron Man priest. I mean, this guy was hardcore. And the further he got into serving the Lord in the Catholic Church, he realized that these indulgences that the Pope was in making, you know, they were burdening the people with uh, to build their magnificent basilicas and cathedrals was wrong. And be the reason he thought it was wrong was because uh, they were saying, if you don't buy these indulgences, which is a fancy word for pardons, that you can't go to heaven. And so basically, poor people can't go to heaven because you've got to spend money to get there. Well, we all know that to be false. Because Romans 10 verse 9 says, what does it say? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. 
and uh, I have Catholic friends, I have Catholic family, and I love them dearly. And uh, the uh, the the biggest beef with the whole Protestant Reformation was the love of money. I mean, and salvation by grace, not not by having to pay your way into heaven, essentially. Well, what's really strange to me is we've, in some ways, with the Protestant movement, we've come full circle where a lot of modern day Protestants would say, um, well, I'll go to church, I'll pay my tithe, I'll obey Malachi chapter 3, which, by the way, was written to priests who were robbing God, not the people of the church. The people of the church lost heart because they saw how wicked and vile the priests were. The priests were the ones offering lame cattle to the Lord, not the people. I mean, the people the people lost faith and lost heart. And But it, you got to read the whole book of Malachi. You can't just read one chapter out of it. And I would encourage everyone to read the entirety of God's Bible because the uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. And we all know that. We've all said that probably. Uh, so going back to the Reformation, which I read this morning, all 95, there's 95 statements. It's kind of written funny because he writes the way his brain works. Is he, he would basically spell out a paragraph and one paragraph would be five points. And so he was like uh, a very line by line thinker, I think. Uh, but a very bold person in the 1500s. He could have been burned at the stake so easy as a heretic. Uh, oh, my. <laughs> oh, the boldness of this priest to nail this to the door or to send this, you know, to uh, Rome like he did. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so here we are. How do we, how would I say we come full circle? Well, a lot of people, modern day Christians say, well, I'll give my tithe to the church, like the pastor says, and I'll be blessed. And my, bar, you know, try me in this, the Lord says. Uh, well, like I said, the Lord was rebuking the priests because they were the ones that were the abusers of, of God's money. And the Catholic Church in the 1500s were as well. And this financial corruption and financial sin is wrong and evil. And if there's two things in God's word that will get you killed, it's sexual sin and financial sin. And so who, who was guilty of financial sin in the Bible? Well, one guy comes to mind named Achan, uh, that when they conquered Jericho, uh, he took some of the, the silver and they were instructed not to take anything. And he buried it in his tent, and he had that. And you know what? His sin of greed, I've always thought this is really interesting. His sin of greed hurt the rest of the camp. The God's presence left because of one man's greed. And greed is contagious, folks. Greed is evil, it, it, it does, a lot of people say, well, that's just my sin. I'm the one that was greedy. But in Achan's case, it affected other people. And the children of Israel stopped winning battles. They went up against a, a people called Ai, a town called Ai. And they're like, oh, we outnumber them. We can, you know, we can just send some of our soldiers up there. And it was one of the greatest defeats they ever faced was the battle of Ai. And it was right after Jericho. So they they come off of a, the biggest triumph where the walls of Jericho came down. And it wasn't because of their reverberation in their voice and there's all this power in my, our voices together creating this reverberation like some people would indicate. Because you know why I can topple that story so fast? is because Rahab, the harlot's house, remained on the wall and their family was safe. So... <clears throat> Pardon me. If it was just this, pow there's power in your words and power in your vocal cords that 
If that's the case, then it was a miracle because see, part of the wall, all the walls would have come down if that was the case. And it's like reverberation. Some of the stuff people teach these days is just nonsense. And it was a miracle that Rahab and all her family was saved because she, being a prostitute, she let down the priests or she let the spies escape. And what did she, how did she let them escape? They, they escaped through a scarlet cord. And do you know what that scarlet cord represents? It's so awesome. I love the symbolism in the Bible. I just love the symbolism in the Bible. That red cord, that red rope, uh, one of my favorite groups, DeGarmo and Key, goes, we're hanging by a scarlet thread. The scarlet thread that went out of Rahab's window is representative of the blood of Jesus that reached from heaven to earth to save your soul from hell, <laughs> to forgive you of your sins. And so it wasn't just a happenstance that it was a red rope. It was the... It was representative of the blood of Jesus that would be later shed on the cross for you and me. And oh boy, that's my favorite topic ever is the blood of Jesus. And I could talk about it. Inexhaustible subject. So going back to modern day, you know, it's like, okay, so how are you tying the Martin's Martin Luther's uh, 95 thesis to modern day Christianity? Well, I'll say it this way. We live in an era, I mean, I know a pastor in our own town that, that rakes in about 300 grand a year. And he, you know, that's way above the mean income of his flock. I mean, it's like probably three times or six times the mean income of his flock. And so, and that's, that's a kind of a low paid, I mean, there are preachers that make much, much less and I'm, uh, you know, I, my grandpa used to be a preacher and had to work full time at Lockheed and preach on the weekends. And, you know, he used to live in a parsonage for crying out loud for many years that my dad grew up. My dad grew up living in parsonages. I mean, this touches my family very close. My grandma used to tell me in Minnesota about the outhouse she'd have to go out to in 30 below zero weather <laughs> to do her business. And so, I think they called it uh, Mr. Frosty or something. They had some funny name for the outhouse. But anyways, you know, I think the pendulum has swung. You know, we've gone from preachers being dirt poor back in, the, say, the 30s and 40s and 50s to being so flush that they can afford Learjets these days. And it's neither one is right. You know, I think that since... Christ is the head of the church and not the pastor, then the, the pastor is just one role. It says in God's word that, and he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the fullness of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's a verse I have memorized. I can't tell you exactly where it is right offhand, but it's in Paul's writings. And, and so since the pastor himself is not the head of the church, but Jesus is the head, we all should be somewhat more equal. You know, we have, we've gone back to a papal mindset to where we all look up. Everybody wants a guru. And I'll have to admit, a lot of times I want a guru because it's easier that way. I mean, you know, why wouldn't you want, it's like going to a concert and you watch like B.B. King perform and he's a professional guitar player and it's like, it's awesome. And I love hearing really good preachers preach. I've been, if you only know how many sermons I have heard, oh my. I mean, I was at Catherine Kuhlman meetings when I was four years old with my mom. And, and so why do I think that, that we need another reformation? I think that the same problem that plagued the Catholic Church, and honestly, I thank God for the Catholic Church, 
because if it weren't for the Catholic Church, Christianity wouldn't have not have made it through the Dark Ages because the priests were the only ones who knew how to read. I mean, they have played a major part in pre preservation of Christianity. And the, the whole Reformation wasn't coming out against the Catholic Church. It was coming out against the greed in the Catholic Church and people like worshiping the Pope instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And... And uh, and so my heart isn't to just sit here and poke pot shots at anything, but to say we must really take a hard look at greed. So I talked about Aiken, going back to Aiken, he was he his greed was finally exposed to Joshua, and it says that not just him, but all of his family and all his possessions and even his animals. His donkeys were thrown into a pit and they were stoned to death. This is how evil and wrong it is. Yet somehow we've, with our sugar coating over the years of tradition, we've sugar coated how wrong it is for people to covet. It's one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. And um, I'm not trying to look angry. Sometimes I have a kind of a crease in my forehead that... that uh, <laughs> I was born with it, okay? It's not, it when I think, especially when I'm really thinking about stuff, it's, you know, it makes me look meaner than I actually am. But uh, my dad was kind of that way too, uh, as was my grandfather. So, uh, who's the next one who was a greedy one? Do you know who Gehazi was? He was Elisha's servant. And here... Here, uh, the story of Naaman, or the some people say Naaman, uh, we'll call him Naaman today. Naaman the Syrian uh, is a, a wealthy man, and uh, he has leprosy, an incurable disease in those days. The worst thing, that would have been like AIDS or something today, or cancer. You know, you have leprosy. And so he came to Elisha, and... And what's he say? He won't even, he won't even, uh, uh, he won't even appear to him. He won't even talk to him. He just sends his servant Gehazi to go talk to him. And uh, and so in the story, he uh, says you need to go wash in the Jordan River seven times. T just tell him that. And so he feels really disrespected because the prophet won't talk to him face to face, and. Uh, so he doesn't want to go dip in the Jordan River. And the servant of, of Naaman says, you know, if he'd asked you something really hard, would you not be willing to do that? You know, what's it going to hurt? You, you've got a fatal disease. And so, you know, imagine how you would feel, you know, you got this white patch on your skin that that's dying. I've actually seen leprosy when I was in India and I've been inside of Mother Teresa's leprosarium, and I've seen people where you can see their teeth right through their cheek. It's really frightening to see. But I, that's what I'm 55 now, and I saw that when I was 19. And uh, it's a very, uh, it's just a, you know, your part of your body's dying visibly while you're still alive. It's just really terrible. And uh, so, so he, so long story short, he finally obeys and, and is healed, you know, and and later Gehazi chases after, you know, is off, you know, the, the prophet first face to face is offered silver, five talents of silver for the miracle. And, uh, you know, instead of saying, well, bless God, you know, thank you for blessing my ministry. He says, oh, I'm not taking any money for that. That wasn't me, and it's not. I'm not worthy of the money. So he and and changes of raiment too. You know, he just really wanted to say thank you, and it's a normal thing, but he wouldn't take it, and uh, which shows the humility of the prophet. And but Gehazi was tempted by it, and he chased down the caravan. And said, "Oh, my master has changed his mind," and uh, so. So uh, 
I apologize for not giving scripture references for what I'm saying. Uh, in the future, I will. And uh, the he came back and says, where have you been? And he says, uh, you know, oh, I've been out and about. And he says, yeah, I, I could see you getting that stuff. And the Lord showed him, showed him what his sin was. And guess who wound up with the leprosy? And it says that Gehazi became white as snow. And so, and then if you, that's in the Old Testament, you fast forward to the New Testament and greed is addressed with Ananias and Sapphira. When everyone's being so generous, generosity was being manifested in the early church. Somebody sold their property and donated it. And they thought, well, maybe we should do that, but we'll hold back some of the money. It wasn't, I don't believe it was so much the, the holding back of the money. I think what they did is they lied about it. They made it out to be that they were giving the whole amount. You know, maybe if they were forthright about what they were doing, they wouldn't have been killed. But they wanted the glory for themselves. And that's, you know, that's a big problem with things if you want the glory for yourself. We all must evaluate why we do things. Do we want the glory for ourselves? Do we want those changes of raiment? Do we want those five talents of silver for ourselves? I mean, we need to live. Uh, and I think that in our nation, uh, we've gone from, we've gone from putting our ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in parsonages and keeping them poor. So they'll be humble, which is kind of pathetic to swing in the other way to where we put them on a pedestal and exalt them to the point to where they're like rock stars. I mean, and all tax exempt. I mean, the whole tax exempt status is because they were poor. So if you get really wealthy people that are tax exempt, that's corruption, plain and simple. And I'm stunned that American businessmen haven't risen up against that because it's not fair. It's not fair across the board uh, to call yourself a nonprofit if you're making millions of dollars and pocketing millions of dollars and buying things for your ministry that, you know, it's it saddens me because we're right back to the same place where we need another Martin Luther to nail another 95 thesis on the door of the Protestant church and say, hey, you know, you're not asking for money for, uh, you know, for pardons or, or whatever the word they called those in the, the old days, they, you, you know, they would they would have to pay money for their salvation they'd have to pay money for when they would sin they would have to uh pay money and and even one of the grievances was as if they owe money to the catholic church when they die it should be pardoned <laughs> and it was like oh money it sounds like more like a bank than a church and so uh maybe it was called the first bank of rome i don't i don't know uh Anyways, the the bottom line is the love of money is evil. And the Bible's very clear about that. And somehow through all of our tradition, we've in American we've Americanized the Bible to the point to where a lot of things are acceptable. And God's word is clear and we must read the entirety, all sixty six books of the Bible to maintain that clarity and that purity. And so I'm going to close today with that. And, um, you know, would urge you to look at the 95 thesis that he wrote and see, wow, this was all about greed. And if you are caught in covetousness and greed, you need to repent before the Lord because it's evil and it's wrong. If you're a pastor and you're strong arming people into giving and using guilt as a tactic, you need to repent of that because the Lord isn't pleased by that. And we should be giving one to another. The world will know you are Christians by your love, not by your success or your, your wealth, but by your love. And uh, Francis Chan is someone I've been listening to lately that I, I think it's really interesting. He says, you know, most of the church does church and it's free 
because they meet house to house. And, and it's like the whole concept of having a really high overhead ministry is not really entirely scriptural. And when Peter was released from prison, where did he go to? The synagogue? Or did he go to Rhoda's house? You know, to Mary's house, the mother of John Mark. And so uh, that's where he went, you know. And the little girl uh, didn't let him in <laughs> at first. And when she told them that he was at the door, they were like, you're lying to us. Of course, as they were praying for him to be delivered, so their level of faith was kind of comical that they didn't believe that God would answer their prayer. But he did. And so uh, I know I've said a lot this morning, and I apologize for not backing it up with Scripture references. I have used God's Word, but I'll be sure to give my references in the future. And, uh, honey, I'm, I'm doing it. You know, you asked me to preach on YouTube, and so I am. And uh, I believe that God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And if you go to a church where this sits under your table, sits under your chair, and you're not using the Bible, you need to find a different church or encourage your pastor to, to use more scripture. Uh, many, many churches use God's word effectively. And, and uh, you know, the, the sound of pages being turned is the sound of life. And we all need to know God's word, and we all need to stir up the gift that's within us. You may not consider yourself to be a preacher. I certainly don't. I have a very, you know, my dad was a really great preacher. My grandfather was a really great preacher. My mom's a really great preacher. My older brother Steve's a really great preacher. And so some of these guys are hard, tough acts to follow. My brother-in-law, Steve Kaler, in Japan. You know, I feel kind of outclassed by people. But I have, a, I have something to share, and it's a different approach probably than most. So, uh, Lord, we thank you for your word, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And, Lord, it separates good from evil. It separates, uh, it cuts right down to the bone, basically. And so it gets to the heart of the matter. I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I hope you're blessed today by this. And uh, if you like what I did, please don't hesitate to click on subscribe. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.